In the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, we come to a section where Peter takes the time to pause, and in light of the suffering and the warning about suffering that he has given, he wants to encourage the leadership of the church um, so that they might understand their role. Not that leaders are above anyone else because in God's flock, the leaders are also sheep, among the sheep. But they are called to lead. They are called to be the ones out front, to be the example, to be the light. And as congregants who are in the position of following leaders, um, we are to respect them. Uh, respect their office that we together have agreed that they share in. Um, there's some very good indi indication in 1 Peter chapter 5 that leaders were chosen and even voted on. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that along the way. So, you know, I know there's a lot of differing opinions about boards and, and corporations and all of that involving in the church. But one thing is for certain, the uh, role of the pastor, shepherd, bishop, elder are biblical. And they're one and the same. Four different words describing one office. Then below them, in leadership position, which is extended more to a service position, you would consider the, the deaconos or the deacon um, and certainly both of those offices are um, forms of doulos, slaves, slaves of righteousness, slaves of Christ. And if you serve in a leadership position like that, you're to serve in a, in a certain way. And that's what Peter addresses right here because he knew in the churches of Pontus, Galatia, um, Cappadocia, all those churches that we started the chapter off with, he knew they would need righteous leaders and men willing to serve in those positions as leaders. And you have to understand a little bit, um, the times have changed greatly, culturally speaking, societally speaking, uh, in this day and age from what it was in, in the first century, um, particularly with women. W women have... Um, now filled in the void and the gaps many times where men were expected to fill those positions. And a lot of people look their nose down on that and say that's not biblical. And I say, well, if the men won't serve, somebody has to. And, and that's just the truth of the matter. Because we need leaders. We need people to direct us in our walk with the Lord. They're not perfect. We're not perfect. But for whatever reason, God calls both men and women to be leaders, to give them special qualities, abilities to speak, abilities to teach, abilities to pray, abilities to sing. All of those are, are great, great qualities of leadership that we use right here in our church. But a leader is to extend their leadership beyond the walls of the church and beyond the body in which they serve to the community. And be an example of whom they represent, not only Christ, but their congregation, their church, in the community. And even the congregants are to do that. But the leader is the one to whom, if somebody says, ah, look at him. Look at what they're doing. They're going to point fingers at the leaders first. Because that tears down the, the, the structure, the leadership structure that God has put in place for the church. So... I just want to read you the introduction of chapter 5 to Warren Wiersbe's book because it's excellent. Um, he says, Times of persecution demand that God's people have adequate spiritual leadership. If judgment is to begin at God's house, which we read in 1 Peter 4.17, then that house better be in order or it will fall apart. This explains why Peter wrote this special message to the leaders of the church, to encourage them to do their work faithfully. Leaders who run away in times of difficulty only prove that they are hirelings 
and not true shepherds. The New Testament assemblies were organized under the leadership of elders and deacons, and you can find that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The word elder or bishop refers to the same office, and you can look that up in Acts 20, verses 17 and 28. The word bishop is often translated overseer. I see 1 Peter 5, 2, which we'll get to. And note that this title is applied to Christ as an overseer in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. Elder refers to the mature, maturity of the office. Does maturity reflect age alone? No. As a matter of fact, I would say maturity in this case has nothing to do with age. It has to do with spiritual development, an individual development of faith, and how that is seen by everyone else, and certainly how it is seen by God. The word pastor, which means shepherd, is another title for the same office that's used in Ephesians 4.11. The elders were appointed to this office in Acts 14.23, where the verb ordain means to appoint by the raising of hands, an indication that voting was taking place. Now, who got to vote? I don't know. Was it just the other leaders? Some churches function that way. Some elder groups appoint other elders, and that's just how it is. Some elder groups appoint elders to bring before the congregation for confirmation, and that's just how it is. Some churches only have one elder. That's just how it is. That's dangerous. Two is dangerous. Three is a good number. It's perfect. It's the perfect number. Okay? Um... I have my own opinions about boards and elders and deacons and how many and what and whom, but it's my opinion. Okay, If you're going to have a board compromised of elders and deacons, you need to do one of two things. You either need to make sure you have more elders than deacons if you allow them all to vote. And if you only allow elders to vote, then it doesn't matter. But the deacons should never have more votes than the eldership. And even in that, there should be an 80%, if not a 100%, agree, agreeable on all matters. And that means people who disagree have to agree to disagree. To go along with the judgment of 80% of the rest of those that may know better than you. Serving on a board can be a humbling experience. I did, I did it in not in the church, but in different areas. I, I'm currently serving on one, although not very effectively because I'm on the truck. But um, it can be a difficult thing to do what you know is right as opposed to what everybody else wants. And it's just equally as hard <laughs> to... Um, Agree to do the wrong thing, to compromise when you shouldn't. Both those things are dangerous. But apparently in this situation, so I think we can consider this biblical, each congregation had the privilege on voting on qualified men. So my opinion follows along with that if I had my own perfect world, is that the elders of the church would appoint elders to be presented to the congregation for confirmation, approval. And, you know, it would take a lot of gall for a congregation to disagree with those that the elders appoint. Didn't you already vote those men in to lead your church? Do you not now trust their judgment with the appointment of who they bring before you? It, it contradicts, but I've seen it happen <laughs> over and over again. Good men being disqualified by 10% of the congregation that shows up for a meeting. That's not right. That's hurtful. And the elders approve those men. 
It's hurtful. It destroys lives of God's chosen leaders. So we have to be careful that when we do such things, that we do it in a fashion where the whole congregation is represented. And my opinion is, only immersed believers, and only immersed believers that have a maturity level enough to vote their heart. Now, what do I mean by that? A six-year-old that has been immersed probably doesn't have the goods needed to determine whether a man who is 40, 50, 60 years old is qualified to lead a church. They say, well, they've got the same Holy Spirit indwelling them as, as you do. I understand that. But at seven years old, I don't even remember my life now at seven years old. I remember getting dried off by my dad. That's the experience. Okay. It wasn't until my 30s that I started listening to the voice that was in me, actually hearing him. No, that's a whole different area of discussion. But my point is, I think if you are going to be eligible to vote, that your parents should vouch for you. These are all my opinions, I grant you. The only thing that we have here is this term ordain seems to indicate that it was a raising of hands, a showing of affirmation. So, sorry I got off on a tangent. You know how I do. Peter was concerned that the leadership and local churches be at its best. When the fiery trial would come, the believers in the assembly would look to their elders for encouragement and direction. What are the personal qualities that make for a successful pastor? 1 Peter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. Look how Peter addresses those men. Alongside, together, we're one. I'm like you. As a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now, that's the only claim to, I've got a notch in my belt that you don't have, that Peter makes in addressing these elders. I saw the sufferings of Christ firsthand. Okay. Now, I'm not sure that Peter is saying that makes me special, but I think that that is a way for him to assert his authority in this letter. I saw the sufferings of Christ. And I'm sharing with you how the fiery trial will come because I've seen it happen. I'm an eyewitness of what happened to Jesus. As well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. What's that mean? I saw the risen Christ after He was crucified. And you will see Him too when he comes again at the time of glory. That's what he means. I've seen the glory of God in the risen Christ. And you will see it too. Have hope. And he has also shepherded the flock among, that of God that is among you, he says. Shepherd the flock. All right, we've got two terms there. We have shepherd and we have flock. Flock of what? What's he referring to? Sheep. Okay. Most of the people in the world don't know anything about sheep. I'm not, by any means, an expert on sheep, but I found it very fascinating to read what I read. Let's talk about sheep for a little bit. Um. Somebody give me a quality of a sheep. Follower. Sheep follow because they have absolutely no sense of direction. If they are encompassed or enclosed in a lot that has a source of water, they know where that water is. 
if there's water two hills over and that pond goes dry, and you open up the gate expecting sheep to find that pond, they won't find it. And if they do stumble across it, they won't know how to get home. Two hills over. They have no sense of direction, nor do they have the ability to smell water, which most animals do. Interesting facts. What else about sheep? we got some shepherds in here. Come on now. Experts, right? What else about sheep? Here's a fascinating one. They have to have their butt shaved. <coughs> their bodies are so frail that if you don't shave their butt, it can carry so much dirt and crud to the point that they cannot go potty. And they die, much like a poodle. What's a, what's a good quality about a sheep? What do they produce? What are they used for? Wool. 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 Okay? We, we enjoy garments that are made out of wool. Did you know that wool is also the sheep's greatest vulnerability? Vulnerability. Their skin and their wool produces lanolin. What is lanolin? It's an oily substance. What happens when you have hair and skin with an oily substance? Hmm? Has an odor. What else? It holds every piece of crud that the wind blows on it or the sheep rubs up against. They're filthy. Okay? So the wool can be great, but it's also filthy. And they can only be clean if the shepherd cleans them. Boy, where am I going with this? Anybody know? Hmm. Well, let's talk about shepherds. So, other than obviously shaving the sheep's butt, what else do shepherds do? Which is important, by the way, because they have to be cared for. They have to be cared for. You know, physically cared for. And in many cases, church leaders, shepherds, make decisions from the basket, from the plate of goodwill, of encouragement, of giving to help others in need. And what's their need? They're hungry. Their need is they can't pay their heat bill. Their need is they need traveling money for medical reasons, whatever. That's what leaders decide on. Now, we do it a little differently here, but it's instigated Often, not instigated. It's brought before the church often by a leader. The need is made known. The leader shares it with the church. The church responds with, yes. Okay. And I think if it was a bad idea, the leader would say, now, I don't know that this is such a good idea. But he would do it very humbly. My opinion, he would say. What else about a shepherd? What's a shepherd do? He looks over the sheep. Looks over. Wow. Connie, what does that look like? Somebody stand and watch the sheep. Make sure they're staying where they're supposed to stay. So they don't get lost. So they don't go astray. To find them. Okay. Now... I'm glad you guys don't, because I've asked you not. But many times when I go somewhere else and someone finds out I'm a preacher, immediately, pastor this, pastor that, pastor this, pastor that. They, pastor Allen, Pastor Tipton. I don't, I don't like the term simply because I'm not sure by the Bible from my past and 
very specific things that I'm qualified for that title. So I like the term minister, servant. Okay. Now, I do believe God's given me the gift to preach and teach and under, understand his word in a unique way. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm glad to share it with you all. But a pastor's role is far beyond the text in front of him or the things he reads or, or the Bible, although that's the center point, that's the focal point. The pastor's role extends to the personal lives of all of you. Now, without the title, I want to fill that role. Now, it's hard for me to do from the truck. I, I understand that. Okay? And that was part of the tough decision I made. But you all have my number. Okay? You all have my number. And you're never, ever going to bother me by calling and sharing whatever. If it's a praise, you know that's going to encourage me. If it's a problem, I want to encourage you. Okay? So... The, the role of pastor, elder, overseer, bishop, shepherd extends far beyond the microphone. Okay? And that's the greatest part of the role. This lasts for an hour if I'm long winded. But I got a whole week before I do this again. Huh? Sometimes, sometimes I just call y'all just to visit. And that's great too. Okay, so shepherd the flock that is among you, exercising oversight. Connie says, okay, looking over, oversight. Okay, now there's a specific way that Peter wants this oversight done. Willingly, willingly, start drawing my branches. Look, if you don't want an elder, be an elder, don't. Don't let your friend, your spouse, your grandpa, your father, your mother talk you into it. If you don't feel that's how God has called you to lead in the church, then don't. Maybe you just are comfortable teaching a Sunday school class. That's it. Maybe you're just comfortable with a Bible study, and that's it. That's fine. Be a teacher. Maybe you just feel like God has called you to lead songs. Fine, lead songs. Maybe it's just in prayer that you feel like you can lead the church. Then pray. Maybe you've got all kinds of money. Give. We all got parts, okay? But not everybody is called to the position of elder or pastor, okay? Willingly, as God would have you. Wow, as God would, how would God have me serve? How would God have me oversee? Should I, should I call uh, Gene up and say, so, <coughs> quilt group, sewing group, what'd you learn? What's going on out there? Should I call her up and get the gossip and Know how to go from there? Probably not a good idea. Not saying y'all gossip. Not accusing anything. Okay. But I imagine there's I imagine there's some business goes on there. Okay. And, and some encouragement, I'm sure, as well. Okay. As God would have you would be from a humble position. Lead from a humble position. I I found out in working with people in the business world, if you want to call buses part of that, fine. I found out that asking people to do something I wasn't willing to do wasn't a good idea. It wasn't a very good, effective way to lead. Lead by example. And sometimes you got to take off your outer garment and got you got to wrap a towel around your waist and you got to wash feet. 
you got to take the lowest position and serve sometimes. What's that look like in our community? Bargain barn? Food pantry? The two most effective ministries, I would say, in Putnam County. <coughs> Uncle Sam needs you. No, Jesus needs you. Man, when you find out the staggering statistics of tonnage of food that is shared through the pantry in Putnam County, <sighs> blows your mind. If I recall, the last time I saw statistics, it was around a quarter million pounds of food in a year. 151 families served. The problem is that is people like me can't bend those boxes and swing them around and stuff. I, so I don't feel like I can help with that. Then don't. <laughs> I mean, it's my back no. No, no I, I, I get that. But that's not the only role that's available. Somebody has to take count and check people in, guide them and direct them. The bargain barn, I think all really they do is kind of fold, put away clothes, keep it neatened up and take the money. And, and usually there's two and you get to visit with somebody you don't otherwise know. I mean, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to guilt anyone into anything. I'm just saying that there are two very unique ministries I think everybody could find a way to serve it. And uh, if you don't know how or what's available, just call Walter. Walter Griffin knows the ins and outs of ministerial alliance functions. He does. He does. He may say, you know what? Would you be willing if I gave you uh, three food vouchers? Would you be willing if I called you to deliver those to somebody? And Walter's very <laughs> resourceful, incredibly resourceful. And, and, and maybe you come up with the idea and give it to him, and he says, oh, that's great. I had never thought of that. That's how this thing works. Okay. So as God would have you, how would God have you? Not for shameful gain. I'm not in the preaching business to make money. I appreciate it. I'm very thankful for you all showing your appreciation to me, but I didn't go into sharing God's word for money. Okay. But listen, there was nothing. <laughs> now I shouldn't say nothing. It was a great encouragement to get a raise. I'm so thankful that you guys showed that demonstration of love to me. Okay. Not for shapely game, but eagerly because you want to. Because you want to serve. Because you feel like that's where God's called you. Because it gives you pleasure to see other people grow. There's lots of reasons to be eager about it. And not domineering over those in your flock. Hmm. What's that mean? Let's think specifically spiritually. Trying to be obedient. What would a do domineering elder be doing? Micromanaging. Micromanaging. What? Mm -hmm. Huh? Sure. Service. Uh huh. That's that's a way. I'm thinking specific specifically about another issue. Yeah. You could probably accuse me of that, but I don't intend to be that way. How about the elder that points out your sin issue and heaps judgment and guilt upon you? Is that part of being an elder? I think that helping someone with an issue of sin is part of the function of the elder. But you got to do it in the right way. Lovingly. With, with respect. Um, as Jesus would. In a manner of not going, eh, 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 But a manner of forgiving. And, and showing love and showing help. Listen. 
Most elders have been there, done that. I'm just saying. There's no limitations on the sins that your church leaders have committed. I'm just saying, I know. And here's my belief. Alan's personal belief. Those qualifications that Timothy, that Paul writes about in Timothy and Titus, they're not to describe the man then, but the man now. If the man now demonstrates these qualities in his life, he's fit for office. Because is our past held against us by the Lord in any way, shape, or form when we're forgiven? What does he say? As far as the east is to the west. That should be our outlook on each other's past. I firmly believe that, especially when it comes to men serving, because I've known so many men, including myself and women, that have chosen a path of service to God in a very unique way at the age of 40, 50 years old, entered into the ministry. How do they live before that? Hmm. Pretty shady, pretty suspect. But that's not who they are now. How about Peter? How about John? How about Andrew? How about Judas? Suspect. Jesus chose them all. Were they perfect for service? No way. Now yeah, go back to the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation for which Jesus came. Judah, what did he do? He had sex with his daughter-in-law, got her pregnant. Thought she was a prostitute. That's okay, right? But, you see, we have all these examples and stories from Scripture. And this is what I love about Scripture. It doesn't apologize for anything. Okay, it shows the shame and the misdirection, the sin issues of those who are calling to lead. And why is that important? Because it makes it a book of books that is totally true. You don't write bad stuff about yourself unless it's true. It's so unapologetic. And I mean that from a sense of being free from accusation, not free from defense. What does Paul say about himself? I was a chief sinner. I imprisoned and killed Christians. Jesus met him on Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Blinded him to get his attention. And said, you will suffer <laughs> greatly. And Paul suffered greatly service for Christ. But he embraced it. Okay? All right. So not domineering those of your or in your charge, but being examples to the flock. How does an elder be an example? And I suffered service, and we talked about this being a domineering thing. But serving, okay, is a great way to be an example to the sheep. To be out in front showing what it looks like. All right? Um, a good leader in public does not show his backside. Ball games included, men. You know, I, I'm the chief sinner in that. Wendy can tell you. Because she'll say, shut up. I don't say shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I tried, I tried to gently massage and caress a man over at Schuyler County this year. I don't know. Kind of worked. But he still went and made his point. But he wasn't a butt. I'm a butt. 
Okay. Yeah. Don't show your backside in public. Let's not show our backside at all. How about that? Makes it easier. We'll be 100% on not showing our backside. What would the world be like then? Could we be accused of anything? Because usually when we are at at our weakest is when we are justifying ourselves. Because we will, in the, in, the, in the matter of justifying ourselves, we will point out everybody else's problem. We will elevate our greatness, which isn't great at all. Look, anybody, anytime somebody tries to justify sin, it always occurs. But specifically when a leader is in a position... Um, and is rightly accused, the best thing to do is own it. Apologize for it. Make it right if you can. Sometimes that goes so against our grain because we don't like that person anyways. But you can love somebody and not like them. You can certainly show love to somebody and not like them. Um, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Not everybody liked him, and he had great reason to not like everybody. But he showed love to the whole world. So, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Now, there were all kinds of crowns. Crowns of gold, crowns of silver. But right here, Peter's talking about a laurel wreath. That given to an athlete after a competition. What does he mean by won't fade? What was the wreath made of? Hmm? Leaves. Leaves. And what do leaves do when they're picked away and plucked away from their source of nutrients and water? They fade and wither and turn brown. Okay. You are going to receive a laurel wreath that will never fade. Think of that. You're going to get a gold medal, maybe one of brass that never tarnishes. I didn't know anything about brass until I went into the military. You know know, brass tarnishes and gets really gross looking? You get a little brasso, and within a few swipes, oh my Lord, It shines like it was brand new. Unfading glory. Our crown will not fade. It will not die. And what do we get to do in heaven with our crowns? Anybody know? We get to come forward and lay them at the feet of Christ. That will be the greatest experience of our lives to show our appreciation and give glory to where glory is due. Likewise, you who are younger, David Ray, be subject to the elders. You're sitting by one. You go out in a hunting stand with him or in a blind and he slaps you upside the head, pay attention. You're going to learn something. And it may have nothing to do with hunting. Probably won't. <laughs> Clothe yourselves, all of you, elders, congregants, alike. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Doesn't matter whether you have a title. We know who our leaders are here. And it's fine. They're comfortable in the situation they're in. I would love to ordain them. It's like a marriage covenant almost. Clothe yourselves all. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect because you're not going to be. I'm not. With all humility toward one another. Why? For this reason. God opposes the proud, but gives grace. To the humble. What is grace? Undeserved merit. Unmerited favor. But it's also 
And I can't even remember where I read this. It was a long time ago. A blanket of protection. That's why I think that phrase, clothe yourselves, is there. Clothe yourselves with humility. It's a blanket of protection. If you serve with humility for your heart's right and your purpose is right, your motivation is right, what can you be accused of? Nothing. Nothing that will stick. People will falsely accuse you, but it won't stick because you serve with humility. Now, if you're prideful about it, you're open to discussion. You're subject to humiliation. Just how it is. Loves like Jesus. That's the goal. That's what our shepherds are supposed to try to do, is love like Jesus did. Jesus did not limit himself to the crowds. He served individuals in various ways, healing them, feeding them, Dying for them. Um, what was the story I heard? A young pastor came to uh, Dwight Moody. You've all heard of the Moody Church in Chicago. Young minister come to Dwight Moody and says, My church isn't big enough. My congregation is not large enough. Moody said, praise God, you got what you deserve. And no more. Some people can't handle a big group. They're not built for it. They don't have the gifts for it. Some people thrive in a small setting. So what? It's all in service to God, and we all need service from our pastors, our elders, our leaders, okay, we all need encouragement from one another. And we should love like Jesus loved. Jesus loved with humility and grace. He served in a very humble way, and he gave, gave unmerited favor to people that didn't deserve it. That's what we're to do. Does that person deserve it? That's not for us to judge. I learned that from an 8th grader a long time ago. Some of you have heard this story. Some of you haven't. This is, I'll end with this. Probably been 10 years ago, if not longer. Gary's ransom's age. Wow. Probably been more like 15. I was driving a church van full of teenagers with my good friend Jeff Butler. We... Uh, did a pit stop in Kirksville on our way to St. Louis and pulling into the Walmart lot, veering off onto that street, there was a guy with a sign. I don't even remember what the sign says, but you know, they all say the same thing. They need help. And somebody in the back, it wasn't Gary, somebody in the back said, shouldn't we help that man? Shouldn't we give him some money? And of course, Jeff Butler and I in our, in our wisdom said, well now kids, important lesson to be learned here. You need to be careful with who you help in situations like that. Young Gary Grimm, who's a genius, by the way, in so many aspects of life, wise before his years, says, isn't that, shouldn't we just help him and leave that between him and God? You want to talk about being humbled. I mean, Jeff and I both felt about that tall. And that's the truth. 
I mean, we justify our not our willingness not to through well, but this or but that or they may or they may not. That's not. <laughs> we're out of our lane when we go there. That's not our purview. Our purview is here. You go. God bless you. And the God bless you is the important part, as I have shared. Because you can go away feeling good about yourself, or you can go away, go away feeling good about what you just helped God with for the kingdom. Give glory where glory is due. It's okay to feel good about yourself. You should feel good about helping other people. But make sure that God gets the glory. You'll feel even better. I know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had together this morning. Um, what a, a simple analogy uh, Peter used in this um, section of Scripture to help us talk about positions of leadership. And, and Father, whether we have a title or not, we are gifted by you through the Holy Spirit in very specific ways to share our, our gifts and talents, not only with the church, but with humanity. And I pray, Lord, this morning that we're all encouraged to um, pray, to meditate, to look deep inside and be open to what the Holy Spirit is asking us to do with our lives and our resources that you have gifted us with. Our lives are not our own. Our resources certainly are, are because of the position we've been put in, even when you placed us, our souls in the babies of parents that we weren't even conscious of before we were born. So you blessed us because you brought us to this position, to the here and now in this life. Everything has led up to this moment. All of our experiences, whether they were good or bad, has led us to right now, to who we are now. So help us peer into our souls, into our hearts and our minds. Say, who are we now? And to go from there. Forget about the past. The good times and the bad times have brought us here now. Jesus could come now. What are we going to do between right now and the precious seconds that lie ahead of us? Are we going to hoard them for ourselves and try to build a false sense of security and, and a false sense of feeling good about ourselves? Or are we going to give you praise, honor, and glory and have a real reason to feel good about ourselves? Father, thank you for the love that we have with one another in this time of communion that we demonstrate our faith to each other and lay our crowns before the cross and give praise and honor and glory to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.